very warm welcome on behalf of British Indian Orthopedic Society on a glorious day. My name is Manish Bhatikya. I'm a consultant foot and ankle surgeon at Leicester, and I am the Education Secretary of British Indian Orthopedic Society. My co-chair is Professor B.J. Singh, who is a consultant upper limb surgeon at Medway and is the president of our society. British Indian Orthopedic Society is committed to the education of the younger generation. And as part of this commitment, the British Indian Orthopedic Society will start a pilot in form of seven webinars this year, which will cover most subspecialties of orthopedics. And these will be aimed at teaching our trainees. And if this pilot is successful, then we'll try to roll on this program next year in form of webinars to cover the curriculum, the entire curriculum. And we'll try to seek help from BOA and the other specialist societies. Now coming back to this evening's session, this is a revalidation session and it would be replayed during the virtual BOA meeting. So our session would be on Wednesday, 16th September and the website says that it will be at 7 p.m. and we'll confirm timings. But it should be available for a couple of weeks, I believe, uh, at the BOA portal. Now, as you all know, the theme of today's session is learning from mistakes. We chose this as our theme because mistakes or errors we all make. It's common to all of us. However, I think it is very important to reflect, to learn, and to make sure that we do not repeat these. I'm very grateful to our six speakers who are all experts in their respective field and do not need any introduction. They have very kindly given us their valuable time and they are going to give us the pearls of wisdom from their vast experience. So all these six talks are pre-recorded and after two talks, we will be doing a discussion for six minutes. And during this discussion, our faculty, the two speakers will be live with us. So please keep the questions coming through the chat uh, function. And I would suggest that you put in your name, your designation and hospital details. So it will be good from uh, that point of view that we'll be able to see how many trainees and how many consultants were present to, in today's session. So without taking any more time, I will now try to play the first talk of this session by Professor Amar Rangan. I'd like to thank the BOA Can and you know? BIOS for asking me to contribute to this session. I thought I'll present to you two illustrative cases of uh, shoulder trauma, which has some good learning points, and I hope you'll find them interesting. The first is a 68-year-old lady, a typical fracture, fragility fracture, fall from a standing height at home. She lives alone. She's an ex-smoker and has COPD. It's an isolated injury and uh, is uncomplicated. And the dilemma was whether to treat her surgically or non-surgically. So one of my colleagues actually decided to treat her surgically because she lives alone and to try and restore independence quicker. So they went on and fixed the fracture. So this is immediate post fixation film. And on the right, you'll see uh, images of this fracture about six weeks post injury when she came back to clinic. I appreciate these are not equivalent views, but what you're actually seeing is that the humeral head has collapsed back to the original position as it was post-injury. And there is some uh, lysis around the area where the screws have cut out in the head. So there's some various um, pre-displacement and some rotation of the humeral head as part of the collapse. So why has this happened? I think the first thing to recognize is that the various pattern of injury is particularly unstable because the medial calcar and the medial hinge has been disrupted. 
And when you reduce the fracture, unless that medial stability is restored, the humeral head is going to collapse back into varus, and it has a tendency to do that. Infection is ruled out here, and uh, we actually discussed with this lady what the next steps would be. So the main learning point here is about the technique if you do decide to fix it. Uh, on the right here, you'll see a representation of the human head in red, the two tuberosities and the shaft as three separate fragments. And then you actually uh, intervene to reduce these fractures. It's important to try and over-reduce the human head so that it sits on the medial calcar, the medial buttress, buttress of the shaft. And the reason for that is it actually provides that varus stability to stop the human head from collapsing back into varus. Once you've done that, it makes it easier to close the tuberosities laterally, if necessary, with some um, bony augmentation or structural augmentation to prevent the human head from collapsing back into valgus. So this kind of a stable reduction is crucial for success of any fixation. And unfortunately, that was not achieved in this particular case. So on the left here of the screen is, is a different patient who had a similar pattern of fracture, but has been well reduced and fixed, and it heals successfully in that position. And you can see that the um, medial part of the uh, calcar of the shaft is acting as a buttress to stop the human head from collapsing back into varus. Now, this is crucial. On the right of the screen is this same lady who uh, came back to clinic at six weeks with this picture. We discussed options with her. She didn't want uh, to go into further surgery. And so we put her through some further rehab. The fracture did uh, stabilize in that position and she recovered reasonable function and is actually living with it uh, fairly happily. So the point here is the position that it has healed in is similar to the original injury, so fixation hasn't really achieved anything. So if we were to salvage this particular fracture, we would have some uh, difficulty because of the uh, lysis in the humeral head and loss of structural bone, and the humeral head will be more like an eggshell as you get in uh, to fix this or reconstruct it. And in this kind of a situation, we tend to use a dowel of allograft in the center of the human head, uh, extending into the canal. This, this is a, a fracture that was reconstructed for a different reason. And I've just put this in as an illustrative example. And that allows um, restoration of various stability and translation of stability and allows uh, fixation of the uh, fracture uh, without extending the screws into the subchondral area and minimizing the risk of cutout. So that technique is something we do use uh, frequently now for uh, reconstruction in, in unstable fractures. So the learning points essentially are that it's uh, an unstable injury, has a various pattern fracture, and it's important to uh, achieve a stable reduction if you are to succeed with surgical fixation. So the second illustrative case is something a bit more complex. This uh, gentleman had unfortunately come off his motorbike a few years previous to this and had sustained a T4 paraplegia. He was a manual wheelchair user and he was well muzzled in his upper body because of that. And he remained as independent as he could be. Unfortunately, when he was transferring, he slipped and fell onto his shoulder, sustaining this injury. This was his dominant arm, and considering that he needed his upper limbs for ambulation, we felt that the uh, joint in the human head had medialized quite a bit and had been stubbed in, and it would be appropriate to try and uh, bring this back out to where uh, it should uh, sit under the acromion to provide um, better leverage for the muscles around the shoulder for him to work. Uh, work his arms normally. So we did the usual uh, examination and found that uh, his sensation and muscle function in the limb was normal and the vasculature was normal. So it seemed like an uncomplicated injury and we decided to go ahead and fix it. So with a, 
a CT scan to try and guide uh, fixation. It was quite clear the pattern of uh, injury was quite complex with the uh, upper part of the scapula separated from the blade as well uh, along the spine, in addition to the glenoid segment being stubbed medially. So this was fixed using a posterior approach, um, and this was uh, well before um, pre-contoured plates uh, were available. Uh, so this was a, quite a few years ago that I've done this. Um, and following his uh, fixation, he did quite well in terms of rehab, and uh, he got back to using his wheelchair uh, independently within about six weeks or so. But about three months after his injury, his physiotherapist brought him back to my clinic to say his, his right shoulder function has deteriorated. And this was his x-ray at that point at about three months. Now I was getting concerned that he has uh, developed avascular necrosis and collapse of the human head. We did the usual test to exclude infection. But the strange thing is he actually had lost function but he had no pain in the shoulder and that sent some alarm bells. And when um, I questioned him further, the penny dropped. He basically said to me something which I'll never forget. Uh, he said that even before his injury, he was able to place that arm more comfortably on a hot radiator compared to his left arm. So that's when I uh, started thinking more in terms of what was the cause of this. And uh, we imaged his cervical spine, which uh, did show a uh, syrinx. And then when we got back to doing a proper neurological examination, it became quite clear that he had dissociated sensory loss. And although his sensation, muscle, power, function, everything was quite normal, as we normally check with, with our orthopedic examination prior to prior to fixation uh, in an injury like this, we hadn't really done the full um, neurological assessment that would have been essential in somebody like him who's had a previous T4 paraplegia because back pressure and syrinx is known to occur in such patients. So that's him today. This is a number of years after his fixation and he's actually managing to live with that uh, Charcot joint. And the learning point here is essentially that in patients like this, it is quite embarrassing. Uh, this was in the earlier part of my consultant career, and I will never, never forget this, that uh, particularly in people with spinal injuries, uh, it is important to uh, do a more detailed neurological examination than we would normally do uh, in our orthopedic practice prior to fixation fractures. Thank you for listening. You get called upon to lecture on a topic because you are considered the expert. Thank you, Manish, Vijay, and the British Indian Orthopedic Society for asking me to speak on my mistakes following hand surgery. I'm going to share with you four hand surgery examples. Now, distal radius fractures are common, and all of us would consider ourselves knowledgeable and experienced in managing these. We know that we need to correct the tilt, prevent shortening, and reduce any intraarticular step, especially if it is over one millimeter. Now, this is the indication for surgery to reduce and stabilize the fracture. Now, this fracture was reduced and stabilized using Kirshner wires. And once the bone is mended, the wires have been removed. And what you can see is the shortening has not been corrected, but neither has the step. The intraarticular step is still present. Now, this fracture has been expertly fixed with the latest palmer locking plate. Great fun to do and excellently well done. There are no wires that are prominent. And the step at the fracture is still there and is very considerable. Now, is this uncommon? This paper, which published the correction of steps in intraarticular fractures, uh, reported on 119 patients who had a bowler locking plate. 
And of these before surgery, 74 had a step that was greater than one millimeter. And after surgery, 34 still had a step of greater than one millimeter. That is just under, under 50%. Here the error is that we as clinicians have not even recognized that there is a mistake. We have failed in our objective to reduce the fracture. Now this is a minimally displaced scaphoid fracture that was fixed internally with a screw and looks quite good, but failed to unite. So the screw was removed, the tract of the screw was packed with cancellous bone and the fracture stabilized with two personal wires. It still failed to unite. And then because of persistent pain, the patient had the excision of the scaphoid and a four corner fusion. And this young person has to lead the rest of his life with disability. Here, there are a series of judgment calls. The failure of union is recognized, but the treatment suggests that it is neither acknowledged nor the causes of the failure properly understood. The solution of, of using Kirshner wires has not increased, but in fact has decreased stability as the wires end within the tract of the first group. So the mistake is incomplete understanding of what caused the first failure and therefore a poor choice of salvage surgery. We, we are often uncertain uh, whether what we are planning to do to correct an operation that hasn't worked will solve the problem. And then we make a judgment call and we make a decision. Um, to do A, B, or C. But when we are driving home, we start mulling over again in our heads, and we are still a little bit doubtful. We therefore have the scenario of double doubt. We've gone through the mulling once, we're going through the mulling again, and we are still a little bit uncertain. And if we have double doubt, then we should not proceed with, with the intervention. We should step back and seek, seek advice. So the message is, if you have double doubt, then don't perform the procedure. Now, this was a finger fracture, which was treated in Hastings. And I thank Professor Tim Davis for allowing me to share this with you. It's a displaced transverse fracture of the proximal phalanx, and we obviously need to reduce, um, reduce and stabilize it. Now, that was done and looks really quite good, cross Kirshner wires, and the surgeon recognized that the wires were a bit short and there was a gap at the fracture site. So went ahead and corrected that by advancing the wires and closing the gap. So it all looks good. Once enough time was given, a few weeks, then the wires were removed and this is what happened. So the surgeon mulled this over and decided to internally fix and bone graft on the convex side, not on the comminuted side. So it's in the tension band mode. And obviously this failed. So he then went on and took out that plate, put another plate from the other side and bone grafted it. And then this took a long interval of months and months before we got to this point. The fracture eventually healed. Fortunately, at the end, the outcome was this, quite good. Now the message here is that the patient had four operations and the surgeon had four strikes. So the problem was that the failure was identified uh, and acknowledged, but the planned mitigation was wrong. So each of us, I'm sure, have our own Battle of Hastings experiences where we have made the wrong choices to solve a problem. I've learned that if two of my strikes do not work, then I step back and I always ask for advice. So I routinely discuss cases in patients who've had two strikes with colleagues to avoid a failed third strike. 
Now, the story of Distillery Radius Fracture Treatment has made me realize that regardless of what my kids think of me, I am a dedicated follower of fashion. Many of us will recognize similar journeys. The treatment in the 80s was using casts, and then Kirshner wires became all the rage, followed closely by every manner of external fixation, then dorsal plates, and currently we are in the era of Bola locking plates. Each treatment was promoted by scanty science, poor evidence, and a persuasive and eminent expert. As we discovered the harms of malunion, pin site infection, algal dystrophy, problems with stiffness and extensor tendons, and then finally, problems with flexor tendons. Here, my mistake was not learning how to avoid complications of each new method of treatment that was being introduced, not absorbing and learning from my own previous experience to look at the evidence first before adopting a new intervention. So what do we learn from all my mistakes? We go back thousands of years and rediscover Rama. <clears throat> we have to recognize an error like the failure to reduce the step. We must acknowledge and understand the causes of the mistake and remember if we have double doubt then don't. Our planned treatment has to address and mitigate the mistake. Remember after two strikes seek advice as you should never need more than three strikes. And finally, absorb the learning so you can avoid the mistake the next time. So remember, Rama, recognize, acknowledge, mitigate, and avoid. Thank you for giving me the opportunity of sharing these few thoughts with you. Thank you. There were, these were two excellent talks by great speakers and surgeons. And we have a couple of questions to start with from the audience. The first question is uh, for Professor Rangan. Um, do you always check for dissociated sensory loss or only in the cases of spinal injury? I, I think in... in when there's spinal in, previous spinal injury, particularly, it's, it's important to check it, I think. That's the lesson I've learned from that particular instance. It would be good practice to uh, teach our juniors in terms of what a full neurological in, examination should involve um, following a fracture. But I do appreciate that with most of these instances, uh, with um, isolated fractures, uh, uncomplicated fractures, um, we still don't do a full neurological examination and we get away with it. Um, but I think in the presence of a, new, in a, a previous spinal injury, I think it's important, important to build in a full neurological examination before intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Professor Dias from Sushrat Kulkarni. Please give us tips on reducing the step in distal radius fractures, Dr. Dias. I think, <clears throat> I think um, the, uh, if you're dealing with distal radius fractures, there are three targets. You've got to firstly um, correct the so-called tilt. It's actually getting the capitate back aligned with the radius. So that is usually quite straightforward. The second one is to correct any shortening and not pseudo shortening, not shortening due to tilt, which is easy to correct, but true shortening. And that is difficult and often not done. And the third is the intra-articular step. The, the intra-articular step is in fact not all that difficult because um, the um, uh, proximal carpal row forms your template to reduce an intra-articular step. So you can just by, for, for instance, by distracting, be able to reduce the intra-articular step, although it may not be maintained when you let the distraction off. So therefore you distract, you put in your Kirshner wire um, a, across it to hold it before you stabilize the fracture. 
So if it does not reduce, then what do you do? And then you've got two options. Um, if you've done your distraction and the intraarticular step does not reduce, you've got two options. One is you do a small arthrotomy in the middle of, of the wrist because the ligaments come like so. So you've got that safe zone of poria there and you can lift off uh, the um, a small area just to check visually. It's not easy because uh, quite often further back you can't see well. And the second technique, which has uh, been popularized by Christoph Mathulan and um, Paco Pinal, uh, is to actually just scope it. Put in a dry scope in and have a look, um, which you, in fact, technically and in actual practice, very rarely need to do. Uh, so the, those are the steps. But at the end of your procedure, you need to have reduced your intraarticular step because otherwise, you, you failed in, in um, reducing the step and therefore by holding it rigidly with your external fixation, you, you're going to promote arthritis. You know, so you've caused more arthritis by the type of fixation that you've done. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, there are lots of questions coming, but we are going to select uh, maybe another two questions. Uh, the next one is again for Professor Dias. Should a surgeon have two goes at a problem or discuss the first failure with his colleagues before contemplating the second attempt? Um, the, the, the short answer is that it depends. For most, most of us, you know, once we've gone through our first few years of learning as consultants, we, we have already faced the common errors and there will always be common errors because you're dealing with humans. So there'll be um, a patient of yours that does not follow your instructions and something will go wrong, but you know quite easily how to sort that wrong. You know, usually if it's an implant failure type of a problem, then those are easy to salvage. When you start having loss of bone or you start having osteonecrosis, then suddenly the whole thing shifts into a different realm. So the, the simple thing to do is to judge your competence to deal with it. If, if you can deal with it, then you should have dealt with it by your, by your second go, because you've got the experience. Now, if your second go doesn't work, then you've really got to challenge yourself is, are you at the limits of your competence or are the circumstances such that whatever you choose is going to be a little bit tricky and a little bit on the edge. And that is where discussion helps you because you're combining experience then. If I, if I uh, speak to another two colleagues of mine uh, at roughly my seniority, then suddenly I've got, you know, uh, 60, 70 years of additional experience to help me decide. And that is what you're doing by the third strike. So you just follow the rule that Th three strikes and you should be out. Then Thank somebody you. else should take it on. Thank you. I think BJ has got a couple of questions for both speakers and then well, we'll move on to the if next. If I start, if I stay with um, Prof Dias, um, what would be your choice of, you know, if, unfortunately she had a distal radius fracture intraarticular with a four millimeter step, what would be your preferred option to ha have done? Well, clearly, I would want a four millimeter step reduced, uh, Vijay, um, and um, and then stabilized in the least risky uh, way possible. Um, so you would you you would reduce it. Um, uh, at my my age, it's not a problem because I'm in the young group, and uh, and therefore my bone quality is likely to be very good. So so if you reduce it and you stick a Kirshner wire in there just to keep hold that. Uh, reduction for a few weeks as the initial bonding uh, occurs, I think I would be fine. What I would not want is to have internal fixation, say with a volar locking plate, and then still a step. Because I think that would be, uh, then I'm set to get arthritis, you see. So, so I would certainly focus on getting it reduced. Four, four millimeters you can't ignore. Thank you. Um, question to Amar is, what is your indication when you've got a patient on table, when do you use a strut graft 
um, for these proximal humerus fractures? So it's it's mainly when the when you don't when you have an unstable fracture pattern where, where the medial hinge is disrupted, um, and in particularly in older patients where the cancellous bone within the humeral head is um, insufficient to to hold fixation. To me, I think those are the two uh, particular indications where restoring stability becomes crucial, and if the medial hinge is insufficient to restore that kind of stability, and uh, if there isn't sufficient substance in the humeral head to be able to hold the fixation, uh, to me, I think those are the two main indications for actually using some augmentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Professor Rangan, once again. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joe. Uh, we got a few more questions, and if you don't mind, we'll be sending these questions to you so that the audience can receive the answers. But in the interest of time, we're now going to move on to the third talk of this session, which is by uh, my colleague, at, uh, senior span colleague at Leicester, uh, Mr. Phil Sell. My name is Philip Sell. I'm a spinal surgeon based in Leicester. Um, it's my pleasure to present this to you. Uh, we invite from Anish and both Jindra and Sunil. First of all, this is all about communication. What the British say, what the British mean, what other understand, others understand. It has always amused me. I particularly like the last version. One of the reasons for presenting this was one of my colleagues, Professor Roger Sakharin, once in interrupted me as a faculty on a cervical spine case because I'd used the word, oh, that's very interesting. I then learned that interesting has about seven or eight different meanings depending on the specific intonation that you used. I'm most grateful to Prof Roger Sakharin for his uh, wisdom and knowledge that he gave me. I'm going to be talking really about errors, not mistakes. Uh, we all recognise the mistakes that we make, but errors are actually where we learn from errors of ignorance, those are mistakes that we make because we don't know enough, and then there's the errors of ineptitude, that's mistakes we made because we don't make use of what we know. Uh, fundamentally different. Uh, I'd like you to think about all the things of cognitive bias and cognitive um, errors that come into making medical mistakes. And to do that, I'm presenting you with a single case that has been with me for some time, as you'll learn. This is a pathological fracture, 49-year-old tax fraud inspector. He fell downstairs at home. He'd had about a week of prodromal neck pain. He was tetraplegic at the scene with just MRC1 power. That's a minor flicker in the fingers and the toes. He was diaphragmatic breathing. He did have perianal sensation and anal tone preserved, which tells us that this is an incomplete lesion of action. This is the X-ray on the right and the MRI scan on the left. You can see the obvious fracture dislocation at C3-4. You can also get the feel for altered bone texture in the X-ray. The MRI scan shows the cord compression at 3-4 and also cord edema across that short segment with altered texture in the bones. Assuming it was a pathological fracture, secondary to a tumour, we carried out CT scan, abdomen and chest. We took bloods for a tumour screen, uh, positioned him on a halo, ready for a posterior fixation with realigning the spine as rapidly as possible as the objective. So halo, there's no obvious primary on any of the screening or subsequent blood tests. And at operation, the posterior spine was decompressed. The lamina were like wet blotting paper. There was no obvious tumour. Fortunately, he had a post-operative improvement of some significance. Within about six days, he was able to ambulate. Uh, we didn't achieve a perfect reduction, but we were using emergency pelvic plates uh, to stabilise the spine, as we didn't have any on-site cervicothoracic or cervicooccipital uh, fixation. First error was this assumption of it being a malignancy. This was 
despite negative histology, and we started pursuing while pursuing tumours, the front of the spine was obviously in need of support. And so on the left, you can see the initial support that I put in with a plate and a tricortical bone graft, and subsequently failing very quickly with pull out and increasing areas of lysis apparent. The first area was probably inadequate surgery. I should have been more aggressive in the short anterior construct. But again, we were thinking that this was a lytic malignancy and quite possibly uh, he might have a short life the tumour from lung, for example. But two months after the first procedure, we revised the posterior system from the lateral mass plates to a more orthodox cervico occipitothoracic fixation using 3.5 millimetre rods. So you can see by two months post-presentation, there's almost no bone underlying that uh, anterior plate. All systems fail if there's not bony union or they're not designed to move. And indeed, within two months, the posterior structure had failed. We decided to re revise the front to give stability at the same time as we revised the back of the spine. So the front was to revised to this long cage and the back we put simply new rods using the same previous fixation points in the occiput and the same lateral mass. In retrospect, uh, I think all the surgery should have been done at one sitting, uh, but in terms of grafting, we used iliac uh, crest tricortical at the front of the spine, posterior iliac crest unicortical cortical posteriorly. We also had him on tetracyclines, calcitonin and detitronate. The patient declined any BMP products having read the uh, So, sorry, Manish, your audio has got, suddenly got muted. Please, can you unmute yourself? Apologies. We finally achieved a uh, histological prospective information in that the regional and national networks finally came back suggesting this was Gorham's disease based as much on the x rays on the histology. Histology showed hemangiomatosis and lymphangiomatosis some 18 months after his last surgery. Clinically, the patient had no neurology and was painful. Gorham's disease was first described in 1838 as the boneless arm. Uh, Jackson produced the biggest case report of 24 cases, which ranged from one month to 75 years of age. All the published literature suggests that if there's a chylothorax present, the patient has a poor prognosis. In terms of spine, we have eight cases reported, five with fatal outcomes. Radiotherapy has a very uncertain role. Bone graft, resection and prosthesis until resolution seems to be the general principle. This is what we did. Uh, subsequently, the posterior rod fractured. Uh, and rather the simple posterior rod because he had a midline sinus at this stage we decided to do tissue expansion you can see the two silastic tissue expanders in there so six millimeter rod for the occipitospicothoracic fixation which went from the occiput down to t6 he was really quite good for about two years and he came back to me after a short holiday in italy complaining of neck pain and a feeling of clunking. And this was the x-ray, which is rather dramatic, catastrophic failure of both the large rods at the back and the cage at the front. Talk carefully about what to do next. Put him on a halo, and fortunately that reduced it considerably, as you can see. It's discussions discussing vascular free fibular grafts, removing the cage, or vascular free fibular graft alongside the cage revising both the anterior and the posterior at the same time. But imaging to see if that would help us, it didn't really help. In retrospect, it might have been good to have done an angiogram to see if there were vessels that we could graft to. 
with my plastic colleagues and assured me that, that we had to put branches of the internal lining up. So on the anterior approach, this is the fourth time into the front of the net. Uh, there were no vessels that we could find to graft to. The internal parotid was stuck down to the cage and had to be carefully peeled off it. And the proximal end of the cage was securely fastened to the odontoid such that it was unsafe to remove. So we revised the posterior rods achieved quite a satisfactory improved position of the anterior cage. It was well until about three years ago we presented with a loss of function of his right arm, no apparent cause for it. The check x-rays were satisfactory. Neurology progressed. We did an MRI scan that showed disappearance in the midline you see a small area of high signal in the cord, but the cord is essentially not compressed. It's fine with large vertical artery aneurysms, right and left. The right was larger than the left. David was paralysed. He was being ventilated uh, and he was almost unable to move. Our vascular neurosurgical colleagues recommended embolisation of the arteries and this was carried out quite successfully, so much so that over three months David recovered. And his normal self. So what are the learning points? The learning points here are rare cases are dealt with on principles rather than guidelines, as you won't find any guidelines. All implants fail if there's no fusion or bone. Histology is really important for management. It's easy in retrospect to see what could have been better. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the British Indian Orthopaedic Society for inviting me to join you in this webinar tonight. Although I have to say, when I heard the title of the talk was Learning from Mistakes, I had a little bit of a Miss Piggy moment and felt mistakes? Who moi? Surely not. I don't have mistakes. But then again, as all true educators should do, I reflected and I decided that the words of Frank Sinatra in his song, My Way, were probably applicable. Regrets? I've certainly had a few of those. For example, many years ago, when I was a, a student doing a locum house job, uh, the registrar was away, so I was going to get the opportunity to assist the boss in the operating theatre. We were just going to do an oversew of a peptic ulcer. And somehow, en route, we managed to hit the spleen. Blood everywhere, spleen taken out, calm restored. And the boss then decided that maybe rather than an oversew, we could do a gastrectomy and a roux en white anastomosis. My day was absolutely made. This was so exciting. For once, I would finally understand how all these anastomoses worked. There was bowel everywhere. And after several hours, I was still a little unclear how things were actually going to work and it became crystal clear that it was not going to work. We had not joined up the right bits of bowel to the right bits of bowel, so we had to redo it. I should have said something. So now, no matter how good the planning, no matter how good the software that we're using to prepare for our osteotomy, I tell my assistant, if you don't understand what I'm about to do, please say something. I think the ability to speak up the important moment is as important, if not more important, than the WHO checklist. Again, early on in my career, I had an interest in trauma. My first paper, of which I was very proud, discussed fractured neck of femurs. But why do I remember this paper? I remember this paper because the very first time I put a screw in a bone, my boss was unscrubbed behind my shoulder, saying, push the trigger, push, push, do you feel as if you're in bone? I'd fail to say that I had no idea whether I knew whether I was in bone or not, as I had never put a screw into human bone before. So there is a matter about timing is everything. So for the trainees who may be a little insecure, the afternoon case, which is well prepared, becomes the evening case. The helpful scrub nurse is now off shift. The kit, which all seemed to go together so easily before, is now impossible to put together. And when all said and done, where is the plaster tech? So now I am always there for the team, or at least involved. 
so that there is no A team or B team. We work together with the anaesthetist, with the team we have, the kit we have, and plan the operation, but also the post-operative care. There is lots to think about, but experience and practice do help, and a second pair of eyes and a second set of hands are often essential. But I'm also aware that there's this graph, and we do like graphs in this COVID era, so this is a graph where we all know that we're supposed to be just a little bit anxious if we want to do the operation well. So some anxiety does improve performance. But of course, the real problem is with performance anxiety is, is it best to be left on your own to do the job? Or is it better to have the boss watching carefully over your shoulder? Both types of training can promote an aggressive style. Too much bravado in the operating theater is a bad thing. But both types of training can also encourage indecision. And maybe the trainee will only know what to do when you are not standing behind them or not there to ask the question. And this has to all be managed with the fact that I still believe a second pair of eyes and a second set of hands is helpful. I've also learned over time from the mistakes of myself and others that be it a new uh, bit of kit like the Taylor Spatial Frame or a new concept such as uh, femoral acetabular impingement surgery. We get the technology that triggers our use. There's a peak of inflated expectation. And then slowly but surely, we fall into the trough of disillusionment and perhaps hopefully come out the other side into the slope of enlightenment and a plateau where we are productive in what we're doing. So we have to be careful with flattening this particular curve. What I've also learned is that there is too much, too frequently, there is a failure to listen to and learn. From the patients and their family, in my case, mum is always right in her concerns. They are a concern to her. She is always right until you can prove her wrong. You must listen and learn from your mentors, from your colleagues, from your trainees. But if you bother to ask for advice, please do the courtesy of actually listening to the advice you're being given and to consider implementing it. Another case of failing to listen and to learn. What is the real problem with this young lady's legs? Is it bow legs? Or is it external tibial torsion? Or is it possibly something else entirely? This teenager I met first as a young child. She had DDH and an open reduction and a femoral osteotomy. She was on annual follow-up and somewhat caught, I admit, in the registrar side of the clinic. One time she came, she was complaining of a little bit of pain. It just so happened that the x-ray included more of her proximal femur and the keen registrar identified an abnormality. He took a long leg film. He noticed the left leg was a little long and a little bit in valgus. He felt that her pain needed an MRI of the spine and of the hip. He felt that she deserved referral to the pain team and the young adult hip surgeon, which brings me on to one of my regrets that there is too much subspecialization in our field from time to time. Nevertheless, the teenager in question underwent a very nice proximal femoral reconstruction. But sadly, that left her now short on the affected leg and in more valgus than she was before. So she was referred to the limb reconstruction service. Thankfully, at this time, she managed to come back into my clinic with a sort of bemused look on her face as to what had happened over the last 12 to 18 months. And of course, where did her real pain come from? Well, I think adolescence is a difficult period for all concerned. And maturity is difficult to predict, whether we're talking about a hip, the patient, or indeed the surgeon. And very often, discretion is the key, or perhaps at least sometimes, discretion is the key. And just because you can, does not mean that you have to. So certainly in my world of pediatric orthopedics, there's a failure to learn, a failure to appreciate that there is both an art and a science to the line of work I do. Growth may, or indeed may not, be on your side. Very little in my line of work has to be done now. I have more regrets over making hasty decisions than I do over having considered or delayed decisions. 
And I thought it's interesting the typographical error on this slide because the considered delayed decision is also the considered delayed incision. Sadly, over the years, I have learned to take the complaints from pals very seriously. There is always something to learn. You think you are running a tight ship, but that's not always what the patients perceive. There are problem areas which need to be acknowledged and then you need to fix them. You must and should always apologize, but that is not enough. You have to change the behaviors too, and you have to make right what wasn't working before. And I'm reminded by, of the comment by George Bernard Shaw, who said the singlest biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And you look through the powers complaints and you realize that communication is the key to almost everything. So if I started off this talk by remembering Frank Sinatra and Miss Piggy, I leave you at the end with perhaps the words of Rolf Birch, who reminded us that it is indeed an arrogant surgeon who feels a knife in their hands can cause no damage. And perhaps in the words of the educator from America, Stephen Covey, it is an arrogant doctor who does not listen to understand because mostly we listen to reply. Thank you very much. Brilliant, excellent talks. Um, I think BJ, you've got a question? Yes, uh, to Phil, um, uh, excellent case demonstration. Um, just a quick query now, I, I'm sure we all will learn. If you had to do this again, how would you approach it differently? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, if I had to do it again, knowing what I know now about yeah. I'd be far more aggressive at the start. I think we took 18 months to get this positive um, diagnosis. And I was playing it as though it was a lytic unknown primary from somewhere. Uh, the chylothorax should have given us the hint. We only got it from a national tumour um, histology review eventually. Um, and I think if I was, whenever I've been asked about Gorham's disease since, because I've been made aware of about five or six other cases, I've always recommended very aggressive surgery to try and clear it as much as you can. And you, but it has a high mortality. It occurs outside the spine. Yeah, no, I think that was great, you know, and, uh, the amazing thing was that he kept following and you had a good follow-up, you know, for, for Yeah, I, by chance, I happened to see him on Tuesday this week in my clinic, and he's, he's good. He's good. Short neck and doesn't move his neck at all, but he's good. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Debbie, very nice presentation, you know, having recently been involved in sort of a near miss, you know, I couldn't agree more with what you said on your, I think it was the second or the third slide where you said to your assistant that, you know, if you think you don't understand, please do not hesitate to ask me because in this day and especially with the speed with certain times things are done, it's very easy to, um, to make mistakes. I think that's a very great tip to anybody who's listening that, you know, you need to, oh, I think the good thing about that, about you, Debbie, is that, you know, you feel fairly confident and in the fact that you are uncomfortable with the fact that you're allowing the members of your team to be able to stand up and say that, you know, that you're concerned about it. So I think I'm trying to do that as well. And I think that's a fantastic tip. Thank you for the talk. As a follow-up to that, Debbie, may I ask, um, we are living in different times now and lots of us have not operated uh, for such a long time and we have become de-skilled mm -hmm. and more so our trainees are becoming de-skilled and there is more chance of errors happening because obviously experience counts. So what do you have to say about that? What, what can we do? Well, I, I think for a start off, we're acknowledging that that's happening. And 
I think it's a nice to be in an era where we can say that and say, right, I've not done, I did a case just now that I haven't done for a while. So I, you know, I had the journal article out and we were all laughing over coffee that I was having to read it like everyone else was reading it. But at least we got that laughter out there and the fact that this was nothing terribly tricky. Each, I've, we've all held knives and forks before, we've all held drills. So there's nothing horrendously difficult. We just have to piece it together in the right order. And if you don't understand, I mean, I was never very good at carpentry, so I was not good at three dimensions. So I was very scared that I would do a varus osteotomy by accident instead of a valgus osteotomy. So that has always frightened me. So, um, yeah, I think you just have to be honest and hope that we can get through it together. But there are certainly operations I do not like doing, even now, with a very junior person. You know, sometimes it's fine, but, and I, I went through a phase where, oh, I can, do the, I can do any case with any assistant. You know, you just have to explain to the assistant what you need help with. But actually, you can't tell them to be your eyes and ears. So you need someone, for some cases, who is experienced and will call you out. So. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move it uh, to the next session. Now I'm going. Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank British Indian Orthopedic Association and British Orthopedic Association for giving me this opportunity. Modern sharp core foot reconstructions is a relatively newer development. And due to this type of pathology, I had multiple opportunities to learn from my own mistakes. And I would like to share one aspect of it during this session. We all know that diabetes is the leading cause of lower limb amputation. It has exceeded trauma. The problem with a major amputation in a diabetic patient is that the mortality following such procedure is extremely high. And this is higher than most common cancers we are currently are aware of. And the good news is that up to 80% of these are preventable. And this often starts as a simple ulcer. And if that ulcer happens to affect the midfoot and our hind foot due to charcoal deformity, that carries the highest risk of losing the limb. So let's examine this charcoal foot deformity and the surgical treatment for, for, for such correction. The problem has been that these charcoal feet present with very poor bone stock. Even the residual bone has very poor healing potential. And quite often these patients present with ulcerations and the surgical wounds also don't heal very well due to the underlying neuropathy and vasculopathy. And an external fixator was commonly used in the past, but patients tolerated this very poorly and this wasn't found to be highly successful. And the bigger problem with internal fixation the past was with the failure, metalwork breakage or migration, and there was also a great concern regarding potential uh, infection around the metalwork later, resulting in the inevitable bologna amputation. So most of these patients were offered only bologna amputation in the past. Uh, however, if you look at the, you know, this topic is about the surgical fixation of charcoal foot reconstruction, but if you look at the standard surgical fixation principles of any foot and ankle, are in the orthopedic region. We tend to fix the deceased segment only. And uh, with the devices available, uh, as the bone's healing potential is reasonably good in most, most pathologies, these, this correction uh, through bone fusion becomes permanent. But that is not the case uh, in sharp cord feet due to the presence of uh, motor neuropathy, the muscle imbalance, and also poor healing potential the deformity recurs. So to overcome this, uh, Dr. Samarco proposed this long segment fixation and based on his work uh, during 2006 and seven, so that this paper was published in 2010. So basically the principle involves fusing all joints, all bones together, a long segment fixation using cannulated long screws. The concern here was that the screw heads would damage the metatarsal heads. Hence, this cutting edge modern device called midfoot fusion bolt was introduced in 2010. And it was considered as the solution for this problem. And quite naturally, 
with the large waiting lists we have. We had at that time, we were one of the earliest adopters of this device. So in this particular example, in a patient with midfoot and hindfoot charcoal deformity, uh, in addition to using a hindfoot nail, the midfoot fusion bolt was used to correct the midfoot component of the deformity, and the bolt unfortunately migrated. Not just one case, another example, again, nice correction, but the, this bolt had migrated, and these required revision surgical procedures. So we published our series uh, in 2015, it, uh, 10 midfoot deformities uh, corrected at that time, uh, using this particular device, six had bold migration, all of them required revision, but satisfactory medial column deformity correction was achieved in all patients because of the intramedular nature of this device. Um, in one case, where we used a plate fixation as well on the top of the knee, there was full, full bone fusion. We found that perhaps the rigid component of the fixation using the plate as well helped achieve bone fusion. And on the same time, even the hind foot sharp coat reconstruction uh, procedures were done using long segment principle uh, using an inter intramedullary nail. Uh, even these had uh, developed the same problem where the distal locking screws uh, started to migrate. This is because you know, there was not strong bone opposition uh, in the presence of such bone damage uh, a bone loss, and also the rotational, the rigidity of the construct was not strong enough. So we added the rigid component to this long segment fixation uh, to our surgical principles from that point. So this procedure was done in 2013, a very complex hind foot and mid foot charcoal deformity. This patient had multiple previous failed surgical procedures done uh, in the US before she, she migrated to UK. And this example, a long um, translateral malleolar approach, one surgical approach to access most of the deformity to retain the circulation of the rest of the areas. Ankle joint correction first and intramedullary nail, nice compression, proximal and distal locking screws. And then the residual midfoot deformity corrected through a wedge osteotomy. And on that occasion, a large DCP locking plate was used. And that was the only option available that could resist uh, metalwork uh, breakage in those days. Uh, and a quite successful fusion was achieved in this patient, again, because of the rigid component to this long segment fixation. Another example, more recent, uh, in this patient with a vascular component as well, uh, very severe deformity with ulceration along the lateral uh, midfoot column. Uh, again, after addressing the vascular component, using similar surgical principle, ankle subtalar joint corrected, and again, nice compression and uh, rigid fixation, along with midfoot correction. On this occasion, again, to achieve rotational rigidity of the hindfoot nail construct, the midfoot mid locking plate was extended to the distal tibia. So this type of rigid construct seemed to work very well in the presence of good bone opposition and very good uh, soft tissue um, preservation. So this patient, even though was wheelchair bone for a number of uh, months to a couple of years, uh, was able to fully read at six month point and remain infection free uh, until now. Another example of an infected midfoot uh, shark coat with active infection is needed as a two-stage procedure, the first stage required uh, excision of the osteomyelitic bone, deformity correction, and temporary fixation with threaded wires, followed by uh, beams plus plate fixation of the midfoot. It's critical that the plate component is added to provide that additional rigidity, otherwise the rotational uh, stability may not be adequate. So we have published our results uh, through different um, scientific papers, but so far we have done 117 sharp coat foot reconstructions, and these patients uh, come with very high uh, medical uh, background, uh, high ASA grade, uh, high BMI, 51% had pre-op foot ulceration, and 26% had an active infection requiring a two-stage reconstruction. Using this approach, we haven't had a limb loss so far. 84% bone fusion, 
we do hope that this will improve further when uh, shock or specific devices are, uh, uh, become, they become widespread. And 92% of patients are currently ambulatory. So this is what we learn from our mistakes. Uh, the construct should be a rigid. So durable, long segment, rigid fixation with optimal bone opposition, which is critical, with or without local antibiotic illusion as needed. It is really important that these patients receive patient-centered, multidisciplinary diabetic food care in order to achieve predictable and satisfactory results. With this, again, I would like to thank you all for your attention. That was uh, an excellent very. presentation. Um, thank you very much, Venu. Uh, you've shown some amazing results. Uh, can I ask you, uh, I mean, this is quite commonly asked question and people will think that, you know, overall, um, people, patients with these complex deformities of one operation, sometimes two, sometimes three, four. And, you know, what are your thoughts about doing multiple sequential operations versus amputation where patient can be mobile? So um, what are your thoughts, Benu? Yes. Um, I mean, there, there are situations where amputation is the only option. If the infection is very severe, or if the vascular compromise is non-rectifiable, then amputation is the only option. Uh, but however, in the past, you know, all these um, significant deformities were offered an amputation only in most centers. Then, you know, uh, Professor Mike Edmonds' work and 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 um, and work from you know other uh, prominent a diabetologist then revealed that a lot of these patients die very prematurely following an amputation. The prosthetic uptake in these patients is very low. Even so-called uh, reasonably fit diabetic people, they seem to have very, very low prosthetic uptake um, by and large. So what happens typically is, you know, after uh, within a year, more than 85% of them can't remain ambulatory because they can't keep the processes on, and then they develop cardiac stroke and other complications, and then they die prematurely. So yes, it is, you know, in the past, the, the outcomes were not satisfactory because we were, we were applying standard trauma principles for fixation of these. But I think with the, with the current established multidisciplinary approach, the outcomes are a lot more predictable. Yes, the fixation outcomes or reconstru reconstruction outcomes were uh, not as great as amputation a few years ago, but they're, they're not far, far better. I think, again, a number of uh, organizations and bodies uh, have uh, uh, realized that amputation is a really bad choice among diabetic population. So I think this aspect of treatment will keep growing. Absolutely, and I, 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 I completely agree, but uh, obviously that's something which people do wonder. Um, uh, the second question from audience is, what is the residual deep infection rate in the series of 117? Sure, now uh, deep infection rate is uh, higher among two stage reconstructions compared to a one stage reconstruction. Two-stage reconstruction is considered if there, if there is an active deep infection at the time of that reconstruction. So if you just look at the one-stage reconstruction group, the deep infection rate within the study period, which ranged from, uh, from a minimum of 12 months to six and a half years, uh, showed about, I think, six to seven percent, uh, or six to seven patients had deep infection recurrence during that period, which is a lot less than what we had previously thought of here. So, but in the two-stage reconstruction group of patients, it is, it is double, double that figure. So there is no single clinical uh, or uh, serological or other investigative method that can give us absolute guarantee that the infection has been totally eliminated in this group of patients. So it's, so it's possible that even in some of these patients, when we felt that during the first stage, the infection has been eliminated or erad eradicated, 
in some patients, you still see some residual infections. So those, are, those have to go back to theater for further debridement. But the figures are a lot, lot less than we, we felt or we feared before. So that ranges between five to 16%. And as a follow-on to that, Venu, in this group of patients where there is infection and you have to do sequential surgeries, yes. do you think that an external fixator might be yes. uh, an, an option? I know uh, in USA, I think there are studies which are coming now to say that yes. um, external fixation could be uh, an option. What are your thoughts? I totally agree. Uh, external fixation was the only option uh, I suppose until about uh, 10 years ago, well, not the only, but the, the, the only uh, acceptable option. Uh, and ex external fixation has a, a very, has a very important role. However, in the past, uh, the assumption was that some kind of so-called stable fibrous union was acceptable. But th those uh, studies uh, or, or, or that literature was based on very short-term follow-up. You know, the, if you look at that published data uh, or papers, the follow-up was between between one to three years. You know, there the, the, the weren't any long-term follow-ups. So these so-called fibrous uh, unions, even in in a non-neuropathic, well-perfused foot. They may not do that well, but in a neuropathic, suboptimally perfused feet, uh, they, they, they just, it results in recurrence of uh, the deformity uh, and you know, pressure ulceration because of, uh, of the recurrence of deformity and, and again, infection and other problems. So the goal is to achieve is a you know, proper bony fusion. Uh, so external fixation doesn't provide that reliably unless if you keep the fixator on for a very long time. You know that you need to leave the fixator on for the double the amount of time compared to trauma. And most patients cannot tolerate having an external fixator on for, for that long period of time. So if, you, if your goal is to achieve a permanent uh, deformity correction uh, through bone fusion, then external fixation may not be the right option in all in, in all patients. In some patients, yes, definitely. Whereas, if you can provide uh, a, an optimal infection-free environment, an internal fixation can achieve that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think, in the interest of time, we'll uh, let Venu go. Um, um, Manish, can I just uh, thank Venu? I guess you're going to leave for your uh, talk. So, thank you very much for. Um, Present, giving your experience on diabetic foot uh, to this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, PJ. Final talk by uh, Vikas Kanduja. Right. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, a big thank you to BIOS and BOA for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to change tact a bit and rather than talk to you about cases, I'm going to be talking to you about the lessons uh, that I've learned with arthroscopic surgery of the hip over the last 10 to 14 years. And most of you may be well aware uh, of the history of arthroscopic surgery of the hip with Cambridge. This is Ricky Villa. He's credited to doing the first hip arthroscopy in the UK and that was done in Cambridge. And I've been fortunate enough to be his fellow uh, in 2006 and be a part of this evolution and growth of hip arthroscopy it has definitely had an unprecedented growth in terms of any arthroscopic uh, procedure and almost 1400 percent by 2023 clearly what we did in 2006 and what we're doing in 2020 is completely different and we have evolved and this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about the lessons that we've learned over this period of evolution. So, lesson number one, the clinical subspecialty of young adult hip surgery has evolved, so you definitely need a comprehensive clinical examination to diagnose what exactly is going on. There are loads of diagnoses out there, 
be it intracapsular, extracapsular, or extraarticular. And every month or two, there is a new diagnosis or impingement syndrome being described and talked about. We really need to be thinking about this holistically as an extraarticular cause, or an extraarticular musculoskeletal cause, or an articular cause. And therefore, you need to be thinking about the hip in four layers, five positions examination, and 21 steps to a comprehensive clinical examination, as taught to us by Brian Kelly uh, from New York. So this is what we do in the outpatient clinic, and you really need about 30 minutes to examine a new patient who comes to your clinic. So that's lesson number one that we've learned. Lesson number two, obviously uh, a lot of advances in investigation, but the real game changer is the 3D CT scan. Yes, we do the standard AP and the cross table lateral radiographs. Yes, we do the MRI scan to look at the labral tear and the cysts and the articular cartilage. But here you are, the 3D CT. That shows you the cam lesion clearly. It shows you the pincer lesion clearly, how much you need to resect. The subspinous lesion, if there is an impingement there. The version abnormalities of the acetabulum and the femur. And more importantly, it actually shows you what's happening in the posterior joint space. And following looking at the posterior joint space, you may actually decide not to offer that patient hip preservation surgery. It also allows us to get personalized motion analysis for complex cases like so, to tell you exactly where the impingement lesion is in how many degrees of flexion or abduction. And it also allows us to actually get 3D printed views like so for complex cases. So 3D CT scan in investigation is a game changer for young adult hip surgery. Lesson number three, diagnostic hip injections are essential, not only for prognosis, but also for actually elucidating whether the pain is intra or extra articular in origin. A lot of these patients actually have pain for about two to three years before they come to us. And therefore it can be a chronic pain kind of a syndrome. So majority of my patients who go onto the list would definitely have had a diagnostic hip injection before we actually put the patients onto the list and only if they have a positive response do they actually go on. Lesson number four, it's all about picking winners. Only those patients who are going to have good or excellent outcomes need to be going on the list. Only those patients whom you can make better should be actually operated upon. So it's all about disease stratification and good clinical examination that I've showed you, along with appropriate investigations, allow you to stratify disease. Our outcomes are dependent upon what kind of patient you're operating upon, the patient factors, the morphology of the hip joint itself, because there are some morphological features like retroversion of the femur, which cannot be corrected at hip arthroscopy. And then on your own technical ability, how much are you able to actually do with the scope? Clearly what I was able to do in 2008, I'm able to do a lot more in 2020. So technical ability varies and progresses as well. And all these three factors need to be considered before you actually start operating on these patients. The Danish registry has showed us that age, uh, female gender, a uh, large degree of articular cartilage damage and BMI leads to poorer outcomes or less favorable outcomes. Certainly if the patient has actually got less posterior joint space, a large Sufi, or cysts in the acetabulum or the femoral head or even edema. These are the factors which will lead to poorer outcomes and we do understand that now. Again, birthday's disease with large deformities or rotational abnormalities of the femur are better off having an osteotomy rather than arthroscopic surgery because they lead to less favorable outcomes again. And finally, a lot has been talked about now in terms of mental health affecting outcomes. And we clearly need to be looking at that as well preoperatively, the hyperlaxity syndromes. Finally, hip arthroscopy is not like a knee arthroscopy and it requires 16 to 18 weeks following the intervention in terms of physiotherapy to get better. So if the patient is not able to engage in that and if you don't have a good physio to deliver that, then you should be definitely considering whether this patient should be actually put on the list for arthroscopic intervention or not. When it comes to surgery, lesson number five is that it's dependent on two Ps, 
you have the accurate positioning and portal placement, accurate portal placement. Now, these are two key factors to keep your operation simple. And if you don't do that, then it will be a struggle right through. So I do it in the lateral position. You have the hip abducted to 30 degrees with the traction force coming in that direction. The second one is the bolster pushing the femoral head out of the socket with the vector force in that direction so that the resultant vector force is parallel to the femoral neck. And this positioning is essential, accurate positioning, because otherwise you do have a lot of complications in terms of neuropraxias and other issues as well, to, in terms of distracting the joint. And once you've got that, then you're able to assess the central, the peripheral, and the lateral compartments with ease. You need a 12 to 15 millimeter distraction so that you're able to actually insert your arthroscope with ease. Your labrum should definitely be avoided. The joint is filled up with 40 mils of fluid and you need to avoid the labrum with your first needle. And as long as you do that, then all the other portals are made under vision, so that'll be fine. And same with the peripheral compartment using the Dean's portal. So accurate positioning and portal placement is the key to an easy operation. Lesson number six, you really need to be engaging with the government policy. Now the story here is that a few years ago, we were doing hip arthroscopies, but the funding for that was paused by the Cambridge and Peterborough CCG. If we did not engage with them and get POA and BHS involved at that stage, we would be struggling to do any kind of hip preservation in Cambridge today. So that engagement led to multiple meetings with the Clinical Policies Forum, and then we were able to establish threshold policies for chronic hip pain and also arthroscopic femoral scapular impingement based on the fact that we would be submitting our data to the non-arthroplasty hip registry. So certainly influencing the policy there. Yeah. And I presented yeah. the results of the fifth annual report of the non-arthroplasty hip registry uh, in our annual meeting recently. We now got more than 14,000 patients on the registry. So very important, both in terms of engagement and influencing policy. Lesson number seven. You need to be able to do research if you're actually embarking on a new procedure like this, continuous learning, and you need to have a good graduate training program for research as well. We started off fairly small in terms of a level five current concepts review, and we've slowly built up to the extent Unless we lost the voice. Docs were leading this uh, on the FATE uh, trial published in the BMJ, where we compared arthroscopic uh, hip surgery versus physiotherapy for FAI and no arthritis. And then to top it all, we've had this book in collaboration with ESCA just come out this year. All this research uh, is essential for the growth of the specialty and your unit as well, as we've learned. And certainly exciting times ahead in Cambridge with disease stratification, precision surgery, uh, robotic surgery, and also cartilage repair. And a well-developed uh, research program for our trainees in terms of optimizing outcomes following hip preservation surgery, be it MPhil, beat an MD or PhDs. Lesson number eight, if you're thinking of embarking on this procedure, you certainly need structured training. And we are able to offer that in Cambridge, a fellowship in young adult hip surgery, along with cadaveric skills training. We do an annual course with ESCA and simulation training as well, and followed by mentored independent practice once you're on as a consultant. And because of these simple basic rules and the vision of a uh, clear vision of training we've been able to attract uh, visitors and trainees from all around the world who've been with us for the last 14 years lesson number nine you can't do it alone it's really a team sport you need a radiologist a pediatric orthopedic surgeon osteotomy surgeon fellows physiotherapist sports physician and a good national and international network to make this happen you really can't do it alone 
Finally, it's definitely not for the occasional operator. So it's not for a guy who's doing a list with one hip arthroscopy, one knee arthroscopy, a hip replacement and a knee replacement. If you're serious about this, then you really need to be engaging in this properly, do a fellowship and have a whole list of hip preservation procedures. And that's what you should be doing. Yeah, yeah. This is what we wrote in 2007. And uh, I'd like to read the last line out for you. That is the acquisition of dexterity is a slow process and is not without complications and should not be undertaken by the occasional operator. And that certainly holds true even for today in 2020. Finally, ladies and gents, I'll leave you with this. Uh, hip arthroscopy has certainly uh, gone through a fairly uh, adverse period. Uh, anybody starting this procedure would have faced uh, an adverse reaction to arthroscopic surgery, but it is the most written about with two large randomized controlled trials in the UK alone and the registry on there as well with more than 14,000 procedures. So if you combine adversity and a clear vision, that is certainly a lethal combination. Leave you with these thoughts, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the whole uh, service, all the fellows, and everybody who works extremely hard, uh, both in terms of research and the clinical service, and all our patients as well, from whom we've learned immensely. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Vikas. Uh, one question uh, from the audience. Uh, you have described very um, elegant clinical examination, 23, 23 steps were there. Um, so in days of COVID, virtual consultations, how do we do this examination? Uh, that's a very good question, Manish. So technically, uh, all my new patients are not being examined at the moment, and they are on hold because we're only doing virtual consultations for follow-ups. And only the history for new patients just to keep them going. You, re you really need to examine them. And that's, that's the battle with the management. That new patients for young adults, you, you need to physically examine them. So face-to-face -face examinations are essential. You can't get away with a virtual consultation for them. That's the long and short of it. Indeed. Thank you very much, Vikas. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll now pass it on to BJ for his closing words. Uh, BJ, thank you, Manish, for hosting such a fantastic um, event. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody um, who's been here today, uh, starting with Amarangan, um, who gave us a nice talk on the proximal humerus fracture. I mean, it's still one of those fractures that, you know, uh, despite uh, doing it on a regular basis, you still have to. Uh, think and uh, about it and he gave us some tips as to which ones to be more careful about and the lessons to be learned. Thank you Joe as always uh, your experience and wisdom uh, for your um, on all the aspects and I know distal radius fractures uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Phil uh, amazing case that you showed us and this goes you to show that you, know, you need to be thinking out of the box if you get an unusual case. Uh, Deborah, for a wonderful um, uh, presentation, or not just on pediatric orthopedics, but just generally how you conduct um, in theatres and how everybody needs to learn, especially in this day and age. You're not just the surgeon who's the main person, but you work as a whole team. Uh, Venu, fantastic update on um, Charcot uh, foot reconstruction. Uh, I'm sure that will apply in many more places um, apart from diabetic foot. Vikas, again, fantastic, you know, hip arthroscopy, um, where to go and learn from. So um, amazing. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. And we've had quite a large number of participants who've been um, in the background. Uh, so thank you very much. As Manish said, this will be available on um, the webinar uh, soon, and we will update uh, you. Uh, equally at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity because we've been thinking about uh, holding some webinars with BIOS. And so far we plan uh, about seven um, webinars uh, in the next four or five months time. The details will be sent out to the membership soon. Uh, thank you. Uh, Manish, you got to say any final closing words? No, Vijay, you have said all. Um, thank you everyone for giving us 
uh, your precious time and and uh, you know uh, it's it's heartening to see lots of people we could not take all the questions but uh, uh, whatever questions were left un unanswered we'll try to email it to the uh, speakers and get back to you thank you very much good night thank good you night. thank you